recording this webinar, so I'm starting that recording now. And I want to welcome you to our Future Falcons webinar series. I'm Karen Sanders, the Director of Admissions, and we're glad that you're joining us today to learn more about your state college. And today we're very happy to present the photography program. And in a moment, we're going to start our presentation, which will be followed by a question and answer session. Just so you know, the chat or instant messaging feature of the webinar has been disabled. So even though you may be able to type, we're not going to be able to see it. Um, but again, you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So now I would like to introduce Roger Link from our School of Photography. I'm going to turn it over to you, Roger. Hi, folks. How you doing? Um, so I will be explaining the photography program, and we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation come up on my screen any second now. Oh. Uh, I'm not seeing it. There it is. OK. Uh, so. The Daytona State College Photography Department it partners with uh, two other institutions to offer a comprehensive photography uh, experience. Um, Daytona State offers the first two years of a four-year program for those who want to go on for the additional two years and get a bachelor's degree that is available all in the same building. There's no other campus. Though, though we work with another college, there's no other campus that you need to go to. Um, all the photography classes are in the same building uh, for both lower and upper division. Daytona State and UCF is the other um, college. And the third partner is the uh, Southeast, Center, Southeast Museum of Photography, which is also on campus. It's um, very rare that uh, a museum is devoted entirely to photography. There are only, I think, six in the country. And so we have one of them on our campus, which is uh, a really useful tool for photography students. And so let's see the next slide, please. And these are the two buildings. Daytona State and UCF are, as I say, in the building in the upper right. And building in the lower left is the Southeast Museum, just a short walk over from the photography building. And next slide, please. Um, in first semester, these are the three classes that you take, in addition to one general education class. Uh, those who have AP credit in uh, various classes from high school uh, may be eligible to to skip one or more of the general education classes. Um, and so a full-time load will be these three classes plus a gen ed, typically. And these students that you see in these two photos are working on projects for the 1101 Photography as an Art Form class. That is a class in two-dimensional design. Um, the upper left photo, they're working on drawings of the perspective of the hallways. Uh, so that's a project that you'll participate in in first semester, and you'll see other sections of that class um, sitting around in the hallways, drawing the hallways to gain an understanding of perspective. And on the right, you see them working on color wheels. Uh, the student in the very foreground is working on a very uh, creative solution that's unusual and that's optional, uh, but you, you also uh, have the option of doing a much more conventional color wheel. Uh, and so you'll learn a lot about color and uh, graphics and composition, and you'll do a lot of different projects to support those in that class. Um, the other two classes in first semester are photography and image making. That's a general introduction to photography uh, for people who have had already a, a pretty basic introduction. Either you took 
uh, class in high school or you worked on it uh, on the hobby level. Um, so it's not for people who are starting absolutely cold. For them, we have some introductory classes. Um, one is usually enough just, just to get you going so that you're, you're ready to start these classes. Um, so photography and image making, 1800, will uh, teach you a lot about, uh, sorry, uh, about exposure and um, give you a lot of exercises in composition, um, and um, printing, and you'll make a portfolio. You'll make a portfolio in all of these classes. In some, you might make more than one. A portfolio is a, a book of your, or a box of prints um, of your work. And I don't have samples from the digital image processing and applications class because that's just a Lightroom class. And if it were up to me, I would change the name to Lightroom. Um, but um, it's not. Uh, so digital image processing and applications is the name of the class. And it's a class in the Adobe program called Lightroom, which you may be familiar with. And it's for asset management primarily uh, so that when you um, store your photos, you'll know how to find them. You'll be able to locate them. Um, you can search on, uh, for, on a variety of different ways. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Uh, these are just some samples of students shooting around the building. You'll see a lot of students working around the building um, on various projects. These are probably first and second semester students. And um, very often in your classes, the teacher will have you uh, go out as a group and uh, and execute a particular assignment and come back within some some period of time, half hour, hour, whatever, and then show the work that you shot. Um, this is partly to get us used to working on deadlines. Deadlines are extremely important in the field of photography. Um, Timing is critical, scheduling is critical, and so we all have to get a lot of practice with that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, in second semester, these are the three classes that you'll have. Intro to Studio and Location, and we have some samples of that. Um, the History of Photography, we don't have samples of. It's an academic class. that You don't do any shooting for that class. You view a lot of slides, and you do a lot of reading and writing of essays and papers. Um, and you'll explore um, the entire history of photography from the late 18th century through the present. You'll cover a, a tremendous amount of ground. You'll see a lot of different kinds of work. Um, much of it will be new to you, I'm sure, even if you've studied photography quite a bit in the past, because there's a lot um, that, that most, very few of us have seen at all. Um, and the other two classes, Intro to Studio and Location is just what it sounds like. Uh, you'll get your introduction to working in the studio and to shooting on location using various uh, light shaping tools. You'll use uh, flash, you'll use reflectors, um, you'll use scrims, you'll use um, uh, a lot of a lot of tools that will um, affect the way the photograph looks so that you can get what you want in camera rather than having to rely entirely on post-production, which would be Photoshop after Post-production means after after the shoot, um, and uh, so in the upper left we see a sample of uh, location work. We this is Daytona, so and I assume that most of you are local, so you know about our various bike weeks and Oktoberfest and all that. And those are always great subjects to shoot. Um, there are lots of other possibilities too. You can 
you can do virtually anything for the location part. The studio part is uh, intro to working in the studio. In the lower left, you see people working in the studio. This, of course, is a shot of them working. This is not the shot that you will want to end up with, which is uh, a portrait or, or some other kind of studio shot. Um, and on the right, we see a sample from the fine arts digital photography. That is primarily a photo, uh, Photoshop class. Um, and so people are learning to manipulate files in various ways to express various uh, emotions or, or whatever they want to. Um, and there's a lot of different exercises. And it's um, even if you have some experience with Photoshop, it's fairly intense. Um, there, there are a lot of different things that you'll do. OK, next slide, please. These are samples from uh, studio, the studio portraiture class, uh, the third semester class. And we'll see some samples uh, from the editorial class as well in the next slide. So um, students model for each other for the most part because it's easy and free. Um, and you can also bring in a friend. Like the person in the, the lower right is, the, is a friend of the student who shot it. Uh, she's not a student in the program. Uh, the other two were students at the time, and so they modeled for their friends. And very likely, uh, the situation, they, they, they swapped positions. And uh, so the pre people you are seeing now as models became the photographers, and the photographers of these two shots became the models. This happened, this, this goes on quite a lot. Um, and occasionally, somebody will actually pay a model to come in, and uh, that's that's good if you if you have if you can afford it. Um, that uh, it's useful to have somebody who has experience and knows how to do it. We also um, have had really good luck using models from the um, acting uh, students and the dance students because they know how to occupy a space um, as well as. Uh, as a lot of professional models do. Uh, so the, and, they, and they look to get photographs of themselves uh, that they can use in their own work. So um, that's, that's a way to, to get new models who are not the same people that, that you have in your photo classes. Um, and editorial, we'll see samples in the next slide. And the photographic business practices class Again, that's a, an academic class. I don't have uh, I don't have uh, samples from it. It's it's not something that you shoot for. It's uh, a class where you learn about the business aspects of photography so that you can be successful. That's that's the place where most photographers fail. Um, they may be great photographers, but if they don't understand business, then it's very, very difficult to survive. Uh, so you'll learn about contracts and usage rights and copyright and uh, various various business practices. Marketing is going to be a very important thing. Uh, OK, next slide, please. Uh, a couple more portrait shots. Next slide. Uh, these are some of the shots from the editorial classes. Um, editorial is a very broad category. It covers virtually anything that can be published. So you can use these kinds of images for advertising, or you can use them to, or it's it's not you, but the publisher will use them to um, support an article that someone has written, or whatever purpose. Uh, and so. We just shoot anything, and um, the publisher will uh, choose which ones uh, they they can use, or they will give us an assignment. I need a shot of uh, somebody on a surfboard from 20 feet below them, uh, or I need somebody surfing on a wave, whatever. I need concert footage. Um, OK, so next slide, please. 
And in fourth semester, you have these two classes, commercial illustration and intro to video production. Um, I don't have video clips uh, from intro to video production. We actually, so the name of that is intro. Um, it's the third of, of three uh, video classes. In, in summer, um, you get your initial introduction to video. You make a two to three minute video um, and then you have another one in the editorial class, another video module in the editorial class. And this is the class, this one in fourth semester, Intro to Video Production, um, is video all the way through. So for the whole 15 weeks you're, you're working on your video as opposed to in the second semester, uh, yes, second semester class, uh, it's it's half video and half stills, and in the summer class, it's one third video and two thirds other projects that you'll be working on. Uh, so this is the big video class. Um, the images that we see on this uh, page are from the commercial illustration pay, uh, class, and you shoot a variety of different commercial topics. Commercial means uh, usually advertising images. Um, and so think in terms of expensive magazines, even though print is, they always say, going away, it's, it's certainly reducing in, in market share, but there are still print uh, publications and they all have a web presence anyway. Um, and you should, um, early on, you should go and hang out at a bookstore and look at the expensive magazines, style magazines, um, uh, Martha Stewart Living kinds of magazines and uh, architectural magazines and just observe, just look at the photography, expose yourself to the work and Look at the good stuff. Um, think about how various shots might have been accomplished. Uh, one in the upper left, uh, notice the time of day. Uh, shooting at dawn and at dusk is very, very helpful often uh, because the light is uh, light is low enough that you can the light in the sky is low enough that you can uh, make use of the lights of the buildings in a shot like this. Um, and the light is low enough on the horizon that it's it's um, parallel parallel to the ground. It's or closer to parallel to the ground. It's not directly above. Uh, all right. And so the product shot in, in the lower uh, center. Um, is typical. You'll shoot expensive objects. You can shoot inexpensive objects too. Um, there's there's plenty of market for those. Um, but you want to learn to control light, color, everything in the shot. And you want to make it so appealing that somebody's going to want to buy these shoes or eat that pie on the on the right or whatever it is. Travel to that city, it uh, might be used in a brochure to, to promote a particular city. Uh, okay, next, shot, uh, next slide, please. Uh, some more product shots. Um, you'll, you'll find products around the home. Uh, you can uh, we have some props left over from earlier shoots that you can scrounge through and see if they, you can make use of them. Um, glass is a big item for us to work on because it's really tricky to light it properly and have it look uh, good. And so you'll, you'll shoot a lot of glass and a lot of highly reflective things, chrome plated things, whatever. Um, and this editorial shot on the right probably doesn't belong on that page. <laughs> okay, but it's it's a very good shot. Um, it's just not a product shot. Okay, next slide, please. 
and some editorial work um, uh, for use in any way that that uh, a publisher would want. And on the right, this is a manipulated file of the type that you'll do in the Photoshop class. Um, you'll work on a lot of different ways to uh, manipulate the, the photograph. Next slide. Um, a very straightforward landscape, um, just uh, excellently done uh, with a wide angle lens and um, just a lovely shot. It, it is manipulated a bit in Photoshop, not not so that you'd notice much, I think. Okay, next slide. Um, on the right, uh, a shot that could be called lifestyle, or uh, it's an illustration for for an ad or for uh, it, for any editorial purpose. On the left, again, you see people working in the studio, and these people are shooting tethered. Uh, which you might be familiar with. That's where the image that you're shooting comes up on the computer screen immediately. It it's, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a program launched on your computer, um, and there's, uh, there's a few that will work with this. And so as, as you're shooting, you're seeing it on a large screen. And this is very useful in the industry when you'll have an art director at the shoot um, telling you this shot's good, this shot's not good, I, I want her more to the left, I want her more happy, I want whatever, can we move the light? You know, they'll, they'll be making demands. And so you'll be the art director in the class. Um, and um, this is a a shoot with four lights, you, you'll work sometimes with one light, sometimes with a lot of lights, depends on the look that you want. And okay, next slide. Um, this is a manipulated file from the second semester Photoshop class. Um, this is portraying a dream, and uh, so she has combined several different shots here, a couple of skies, at least one sky, um, several different bird shots, and a self-portrait. And it's very excellently done. Uh, she's gone on to have major success in, uh, in the San Francisco market. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Another um, Portrait, this one, ultra high contrast. Initially, you will learn to shoot so that you're not blowing out any details or underexposing any details. Um, but after you learn that lesson and you, after you've learned the rules, then you can break the rules. Um, and rules are made to be broken, but we need to know how to do uh, the conventional shooting um, in order for when when we want to do unconventional work um, for it to be intentional, not accidental. And that is the case with this uh, student, a very hardworking and gifted student. Um, and uh, so it's also an, an interesting composition. The, the figures way over on the left and a lot of uh, white space on the right. And yet, I don't think the space on the right is what you'd call dead space. Um, it sort of needs to be there. If you crop this photo tighter, I think it would lose a lot of power uh, if you cropped off the, the white on the right. And I think that might be the last slide. You want to try advancing? No, uh, there's a couple more. Um, on the left, we see a uh, left and upper right. We see critiques. Uh, so this will happen in most classes about every two weeks or so. Um, you'll bring in the 
batch of work that you have so far. Um, it'll be one or two assignments that you'll be displaying. And you'll help each other to see, you'll, you'll share your point of view with with the class. Critique, sometimes we get nervous about them at first, especially. Uh, we think we're going to be judged, we're going to be judged harshly. Um, that is really not the case. Critique is for uh, sharing your point of view with people. And so if you're not getting what they're trying to convey, you just say, I'm not getting it. It's, it, it's not an insult to them. Uh, and um, it, they need to know uh, that this project that they are either very proud of or maybe maybe they're not um, happy with at all. Maybe the, sometimes uh, this is this happens. Uh, the, the, the student who has shot, um, who's displaying their work, is not seeing the beauty in it, and then the class begins to point out, and the teacher. Uh, what is particularly interesting about this shot, about that shot, and avenues that the student could then continue to explore. Um, okay, and in, in the upper right, uh, a different way of displaying work. We have some critique rooms, uh, small rooms with black uh, boards, and we have these uh, Studios, uh, or rather, um, te yeah, teaching studio, um, teaching teaching labs. Sorry, uh, that's what it is—a teaching lab. And so we'll put prints up on a cork board or on the floor, and we'll display them like that. Um, and in the lower right, just a, a student working, uh, looking, observing, uh, trying to get. The shot, right? And it, and the shot, you'll often get shots of your your classmates working because they often make very interesting shots. You'll people are concentrating, they're trying to uh, trying to get it right, and so like this, it sometimes makes a really good shot. Okay, next slide. Uh, a couple more people working. This I'm pretty sure is the last slide. So. Um, on the right, you see somebody getting a low angle shot. Uh, one thing that kills amateur photography a lot is that people don't want to get high or low. Um, we have a, an assignment in second semester that's repeated all through your whole career uh, called high, low, near, far. You shoot a subject at uh, you get a low angle shot, you get a high angle shot, you get a distant shot, and you get a, a close up. Um, and you do that on several different subjects. Um, it's vitally important that we move the point of view around to get the shot. Um, amateurs will often just stand and uh, not even bend their knees. Just every, everything is shot from the same from the uh, eye level, and that's what makes it look amateurish. Uh, what what makes a professional shot look more interesting is that we go where the shot is, and the shot may be uh, in a different um, place uh, in terms of high and low. It may be a different time of day. Uh, I, I mentioned going out at dawn and at dusk. Um, we get bitten by mosquitoes a lot, and uh, we uh, we risk other dangers as well. We have to be very careful. Sometimes um, students will want to go out into swamps and things and uh, or places and um, shoot interesting scenes that not everybody can get but you have to go out with with other people and you have to be aware really really critical that you be aware of your surroundings uh, out in a swamp you could step on a cottonmouth um, it's uh, it's or you could just trip over a, a, a root a tree root and uh, be in trouble um, so go out with people and 
um, that enables you to shoot at the times of day and in the places that um, not everybody will take the trouble to go and shoot. Um, and on the left, you see people working in one of the teaching labs. Um, they each have a different shot on their screen, so that means they are working on their individual work. Sometimes uh, the teacher will be displaying work, and uh, so everybody will have the same shot on their screen um, when the teacher wants to project something onto, onto everybody's screen. And you see some work up on the critique rail in the front of the class. So they've just had a critique or they're getting ready to have one. And I think that's about it. Uh, Want to see if there's another slide? No, I think that's it. OK, so we can open it up to questions now. All right, thank you, Roger. We're going okay. to open up a question and answer center um, on your screen. And um, hopefully you'll be able to see it. Uh, if not, I'm also going to unmute the microphones. But if you have a little tab at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, you can click on that and type your question in, and we'll be able to address your question that way. Or I am also unmuting the audience. Um, so let's see. And. Did that work? Um, I think you have a little button on your screen that says go ahead and unmute my, my microphone. So if you'd like to, to actually speak your question, you are welcome to. And we'll give it just a moment. And Roger, um, one of our guests wants to know if you, if there are any limitations to the program. Do you need to have a meeting with, um, with you or other faculty before getting in the program? Um, in the past, I mean, when when we're when we don't have a coronavirus uh, uh, afflicting us, uh, what we do is have a, an in-person meeting where I convey. Uh, all the information that I just did and show you around the building. Um, now we're not doing that. We hope to start back up again in the fall. So what we're doing in the meanwhile is uh, I will email you a lot of materials uh, and explanations uh, that help you to understand it and then you select the sections of each class, because there are two or three sections of each class uh, that meet at different days and times. And so you look at your schedule and figure out which sections you want of the various classes, and then send them to me, and then I'll uh, get you registered. And so that's, oh, I'm sorry. That's, go ahead. Yeah, so that replaces the in-person meeting that we conventionally do. All right, and do students have to buy their own cameras and equipment? Uh, yes, uh, for the most part, but we also have a stock room where we have a lot of equipment that students can either rent or uh, borrow. Um, it depends on the item. There are two different lists. There's a, a list of equipment that can be checked out for free uh, for three days, five days, depends on the item, and uh, a list of equipment that can be rented. And the, the fees are all very, very low. Um, and we ask that you be careful with the equipment. Don't don't risk, uh, you know, don't, don't take it to the beach, although we have beach shots. Um, uh, don't, um, don't abuse the equipment and return it on time. And for a nominal fee, you can have access to some really excellent equipment. And so uh, we have some digital cameras. And for students who don't have one um, and are not able to get one, you can, you can rent from us. It's good to get it on the first day, though, because they go very quickly. And we don't have a lot of them. Um, other than that, 
uh, normally you do buy your own camera body and at least one lens uh, to start the program. And then in second semester, you'll buy a flash as well. Again, maybe you'll just check the flash out or rent it from the stockroom. Um, and there are additional lenses that for your camera, if you get a Nikon or a Canon. Um, we have a lot of Nikon and Canon lenses and third party lenses that will fit Nikons and Canons. And you don't need to get the most expensive Nikon or Canon. Um, most of the top pros don't even use the most expensive ones. Um, you can get a beginner's model, uh, a good prosumer model, so called. Um, you have to be able to control aperture and shutter uh, and ISO, and you have to be able to detach the lens and put a different lens on. And we can help you with those choices. If you uh, get my email address at, at the end of this, um, you can contact me and you can contact the, the guys in the stock room who are very knowledgeable about the whole range of equipment. Um, and they will be very happy to advise you. You know, students will write to us and say, um, considering this model, what do you think? And so we'll tell. All right, I just posted your email address in the Q&A section, roger.link, L-I-N-K-E, at DaytonaState.edu. Um, another question that came in is, can I take any of these classes if I'm not a photography major? Um, I don't think so. Uh, there are, there is a rule in the school that, or statewide actually, um, that was passed only in the past couple of years um, that, well, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of financial aid. If you're getting financial aid, you need to stay within your major. Um, if you're paying for your own classes, then I think you can take anything you want. And, and Karen, maybe you can help me with that. Do you, do you have more information about that? Um, yes, I think the, the question is, as a, do you allow non-degree seeking students or pleasure photographers oh. who just want to take a class or two? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. And are there any certifications in this industry? that go along with the degrees? Uh, there are various organizations that offer certifications and um, I don't believe that they have a great deal of utility. Uh, the main thing that you need is a strong portfolio. Um, when you show that to uh, prospective clients and nowadays of course portfolios is, is most often in in the form of a website um, but you'll want a printed portfolio too I would I would think but still um, when people can see your work and see that you can do the work that they want that's it that's all you need can students generally um, be employed with at the point they have their associate degree, or do they really need to plan on to finish the bachelor's degree? That's a very individualized uh, decision. Um, we, for a long time, were strictly a two-year program before we developed our partnership with UCF to offer the bachelor's. Um, and so all we had was people graduating after two years, and those people have gone on to um, uh, I don't want to suggest that all of them have gone on to this, but the, the, the top pr producers, the, the people who worked really hard, um, have gone on to um, huge success and uh, have worked for National Geographic and, and all, all the important magazines and have uh, worked on uh, videos that are, that are shot, uh, that are uh, displayed commercially, um, and yeah, had had tremendous success. Uh, so yes, it's quite possible to just do the two years and start working. 
um, the people who go on to get a bachelor's degree are people who feel a need for more study. If you've acquired all the skills that you need um, in two years, by all means, go work. Um, if you, there are people, I mean, these are all young people, well, mostly, we have a range of age, but um, very often you're just catching on uh, by third or fourth semester. You're just really beginning to click. Um, young people will go through all kinds of emotional issues and, and family things and, and uh, learning to live on their own and learning to uh, become themselves, uh, develop their own personalities and be discovering what their real interests are. And so it, it not everybody is ready after two years to, not everybody has been a great student after two years. You, you may have, uh, you may feel a need for, uh, you may get to the end of the two years and realize, gee, now I could really do it. Now I know what it's about and I, I could really do a good job at this. And so um, often that kind of person will decide to do another two years of study. Uh, there, there are several reasons that somebody might want to get a bachelor's, but it, but you can work after two years if, if you've worked really hard and, and, and you comprehend uh, the lessons and you're able to produce work. All right, I think that uh, wraps it up in terms of our questions. I haven't seen anything um, else come in. Or if, uh, if I do, then I'll stop. But just a couple of reminders, everyone. Our summer B classes begin on June 29th and fall classes begin on August 24th. Registration for both semesters is open now. So if you haven't done so, now is the time to apply online and register for your classes. And Daytona State College is open and here for you. Student services on our campuses are available by appointment at this time. You can also schedule campus tours by appointment. And we're all here available by phone, email, or web chat. If you have any questions, you can give us a call here in admissions, 386-506-3642. Or you can email us at admissions at daytonastate.edu. And again, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We hope that we, you will join us again for other future webinars. Just visit daytonastate.edu slash webinars to see our upcoming schedule or to view the recorded uh, historical webinars. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Have a good day.